Thanks everybody for coming, Friday night, um, warming climate and the rise of walls. I'm Mark Lisby, I teach in the philosophy department here and English and uh, advisor to the Students for Social Change Club. Um, our club along with the Latinx Collective and the Undocumented Community Resource Center here at BCC help co-sponsor the event to bring uh, Todd Miller here tonight. So, you know, tonight's topic really will try to look at the connection between environmental destruction and displacement and the increasing walls of separation that we see happening all over the world, in fact. It's about an estimated 20 million people are displaced uh, every year due to climate change related events. It used to be that uh, military and internal conflicts were the largest cause of uh, displacement. Now it's uh, climate change. Um, and really, uh, those that are displaced by this are climate refugees who have to uh, flee in order to survive, and increasingly they're being met with militarized borders and policies to try to keep them out, as, which is no stranger to the United States. Um, and so really, I think it's important because what kind of world are we living in when we see corporations can destroy the environment, forcing millions of people to flee for their survival, and then governments pass laws to punish people for fleeing in the first place. That's not a, a world I think uh, is worth um, accepting, and it's one that needs to change. And so our, we're lucky tonight to have uh, our speaker, Todd Miller. He's an independent journalist who's been covering this topic and researching about border issues for more than 15 years. Um, he's written three books on the subject, one, but Border Patrol Nation, and in 2017, Storming the Wall, Climate Change, Migration, and Homeland Security, and his most recent book, Empire of Borders, The Expansion of U.S. Border Around the World. He's come visiting us from Tucson, Arizona, so please join me in welcoming Todd Miller. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that um, introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here at Berkeley City College, first time I've set foot on here in my life. So um, I got in yesterday from Tucson, Arizona, as, as Mark mentioned. That's where I live, about 60 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and yeah, so tonight um, I'm going to focus uh, my comments on this book, which is called Storming the Wall. And Storming the Wall, um, uh, connects the dots between climate change, displacement, and borders, or, or as the subtitle says, clim climate change, migration, and homeland security. Um, for this book, um, I went to many different places around the world, um, including I was at the Paris um, Agreements in 2015 the, in, in uh, the climate summit. I went to Honduras and Guatemala. I went. I li did a lot of research on the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and I. I went to, Phil to the Philippines, and each of the places I, I talked to, as many people as I possibly could, um, from those most impacted to high officials, I'm really trying to look at those connections between borders and, and climate change and displacement. Um, in each of those places, I tried to find as compelling stories as possible that would illustrate those um, connections and um, I really, in that spirit, I'd like to do the presentation tonight. I'd probably want to talk for about maybe 40 minutes or so and then leave, leave a lot of room for discussion if people want to have discussion afterwards, if that sounds good. Um, the first story I want to share, it actually comes from the Philippines. Um, and I share this story uh, um, first for many reasons. One of the reasons is uh, the Philippines is the place where my grandmother's from, and I and as part of the research for for this book, I went to the island where my grandmother is from, at, uh, an island called Amarinduque, which is about six hours to the south of Manila. For people who are familiar with the Philippines, um, and when I was there, I talked, like I said, I talked to many different people, um, including you know. Uh, you know, a, a, an official for the province of Marinduque who, who specialized in, 
in um, disasters and, and, and had co just come out with a report about what was gonna happen in the, in the, on this island in two, by 2050. And so uh, um, one of the things that he pointed out was sea level rise. And he, and he pointed out to, to like, there's several places on the island where I could go to check this out. And so I went to a place um, near the community, a community called Balogo. And, and, I, and I still remember this walk very vividly because I was, I was walking um, down the beach and there was a typhoon in the northern Philippines that was kind of far away, but it was still making, the, the sky was gray and the, the ocean was agitated. There was lots of waves and there was a bit of a surge coming in. And I got to this house um, and the house was, uh, destroyed. And the, and the waves, the, the surge was, the waves are going in and out of the house. Um, and it wasn't destroyed because of the storm surge, it was just, it had been destroyed before. Um, but it obviously had been destroyed because the sea level had, had risen. And it was, and for me, and this was in August of 2015, it was the first time I'd ever seen a house destroyed by sea level rise um, on my grandmother's island. And so I talked to a fisherman not too long after that, and he pointed out to this buoy, and this buoy was like about a little bit, like 15 feet in, into the water. It was pretty far out there, and, he, and he, I could see it rocking in the distance, and he said, um, that's where the shore used to be. The sea had come in quite a bit. It was, it was really encroaching. And then um, what happened after that was a, a young, man came out holding a child and the child was in his arms and the, the child must have been one or two years old. And that, that image really struck me too because I, um, at the time I was four months away from having my own child, right? So a lot of my conversations in this island was with this unborn child and then with my grandmother as well, who was, so it was like almost spanning 200 years in my mind, you know, and thinking about climate change. And, um, and so when, the when, when I saw the child, I automatically started to think because the fishermen had talked about how they had been responding to sea level rise, how they had moved, moved their homes back, um, how uh, the, a lot of the homes had moved back, but I started to think what's, what was gonna be the reality there in like 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? What would be, what would be this child's reality? Um, and uh, like would the water come in more would they have to move the houses back more? Would the, the, the salt water get in the irrigation systems and ruin the rice fields? Would they have to move? Would this child have to move later in his life? Would he have to go to Boac, which is the, the capital of the province, or would he have to go to, to um, Manila, the capital of the Philippines, or would he have to go further somewhere across the border, face the barbed wire, the fences, the walls, the drones, the guns, the armed guards? that we're seeing more and more and more and more around the world. Was that, would that be the reality of this child? So I got to thinking about that and um, I uh, actually backed off and, and just started writing. Is, is there any writers in here? Because it's like one of those moments, right? One of those moments of when you're a writer that you just start writing. And, and I just started writing the whole, the whole scene and, um, and I didn't know what I was gonna do with it, but it actually, um, it actually became um, the the opening scene for uh, the opening scene in Storming the Wall, the the, the book I'm discussing tonight. <clears throat> and on hindsight, I think about that moment too because it's because of that moment that I'm here sharing what I know of this with with you tonight. It's it's because of that moment, you know, thinking about that child and my own child now, who's four years old, and I look into his his beautiful eyes, and I, and I think about the future, his future, and, um, and, uh, and really a lot, of, a lot of the things that I'm doing now are, are for him and his generation, right, and the future generations. Um, and, and as I'll describe tonight, um, there's, there's an utter need for a sort of counter vision to what is going on, to what is, what is being put in place today. Um, and, uh, and um, yeah, so, so that is one story. The, another story from the Philippines happened in Tacloban. Tacloban, people might be familiar with, in the province of Leyte, 
in the eastern Visayas of the Philippines. It was where, in November of 2013, the most powerful typhoon ever to make landfall hit. And um, in, in Top Globe, and I interviewed a, a muralist, actually, his name was A.G. Sanyo. He was there. He has a lot of family in Top Globe, on, um, but he was from Manila. But he, he was there when the typhoon was about to hit. He went, he went, he actually, not to be a burden on his family, he went to stay in a hotel that was near, about four blocks away from the bay and went to sleep. And the typhoon hit in the night. And when he woke up, he looked up and the roof had been ripped off the top of his, his hotel, his, his room. So he's on the fourth floor. Water was cascading into his room. He said he could feel the foundations of the hotel shaking with the wind. He said that with every crack, crack, crack and crevice in that hotel room, you, there's a high-pitched whistling sound because the wind was so strong. And he told me that he, plan, he started planning for his own death. He wondered if his family was going to find him in the rubble below. Um, eventually, he actually got up, obviously survived because I interviewed him. He got up and um, went down to the third floor. The third floor, it turns out, is the only floor that's that's um, safe in the whole hotel. The first floor had been totally flooded by the surge and so had the second floor. Um, and he, long story short, he, he survived with about 60 other people. But he ended up, um, tell, and, he, and he told the story really vividly, he ended up for the next three days helping um, gather bodies. Uh, and he walked through this, the city of Tacloban um, and he said, with my own two hands, I gathered 78 bodies. 78 bodies of what, according to the Philippine government, was over 6,000 people who were killed. According to everyone else, more, like 10,000. I heard one quote of 15,000. Um, 15,000 killed and over a million people displaced due to this, this typhoon. And so then those two stories in the Philippines, and when you're in the Philippines, everyone, the idea of climate change, for, and, and for me too, it was when I went to the Philippines, I, 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 I wasn't a climate denier, by any, and I was, in, I was definitely thinking about climate change, um, but in a more abstract sort of way. And it was really those experiences there that really made it, went from abstract to really raw and real and, and really kind of in your face. And, also, when you think about it, like those glimpses of the sea level rise in Marinduque or the, or the blasting typhoon Haiyan that hit um, Tacloban, those are glimpses of what scientists are saying are the, in the future. Um, they're two glimpses of what we can expect of, more of. And also, we can, you know, along those lines in that framing, we can expect more displacement of human beings than ever before in human history. Um, with that, I'll, I want to turn to Central America, um, or better said, Mexico, um, Mexico's, Mexico's southern border. Um, I was in a place called Tenosique. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Tenosique. It's um, the state of Tabasco, about um, 20 miles away from the Guatemalan border. And I was there uh, for a few days um, talking to people. And, it, and it's one of the places where people would get on the train. So there's a train yard there and um, where the, the beast, the bestia. And um, I, was, I was in the train yard and I remember like being in the train yard and seeing um, a patrol car go by. And there was a, um, it was like a military patrol and they, the soldiers had masks on and they were kind of looking in the train yard and it just reminded me, like, it was 2015 and 2014, Mexico really started to bolster its southern border with tremendous pressure from the United States and resources from the United States. It's almost to the point where, um, like, U.S. officials have said, he said before them that the Mexico's southern border is now, is, now, um, is now the U.S. southern border, right? There's so much going into it. Um, we can discuss that later in the in the in, in when we're just in the conversation after the talk. But but um they the um I met after the, the patrol car went by, I ended up talking to three farmers from Honduras. Um we got talking, they'd been in the in the um in the train yard for about six days. They tried to get on the train the night before, uh that but the train was moving too fast. That was a, that was another tactic that was being used. The, if you speed up the trains then people won't jump on the trains. 
and um, they didn't jump on the train. If they had even got on the train the night before, there was an immigration checkpoint about a mile up because I had talked to other people who actually got on the train and they ended up having to jump off the train anyhow. Um, so they were there, they were waiting for their op opportunity to, to head north. They were, they were gonna head to the United States, that was their plan. And they started telling me the story about what was happening and, and where they were from and in Honduras. And lo and behold, the main, the, what they told me is there, there was no rain. There was no rain. And with no rain, there was no, no harvest. And with no harvest, there was no food. And with no food, there's a crisis. And that's why they're, they were on the move. Um, and it turns out, I'm, later I, I researched exactly what happened, and it, it turns out there was a major drought, one of many major droughts that have ha been happening um, in through what's known as the dry corridor through, in Central America that impacted a million people. Um, one mayor in a nearby community said, this is an unprecedented calamity. Another a climate scientist I interviewed who's doing climate modeling in Central America said Central America is a quote unquote ground zero for climate change in the Americas. And, and he said those, those sorts of droughts and scrambling of seasons, those sorts of things um, are, um, have been intensifying, have become more frequent and are projected to intensify into the future. But also, as you know, Central America is also an isthmus and with gigantic bodies of water on either side and hurricanes, massive hurricanes, have spun off and caused quite a bit of havoc, including mudslides and flooding and, and everything that hurricanes cause. Um, and uh, so with those two factors is like ground zero. And those numbers have even like, um, a newer report that I, I read that came out about a year ago showed that two million people for the last couple years have been impacted by these extreme weather events associated with climate change. And this is from the World Food Program. So two million people, 1.4 million of those two million people, they say in peril. Um, so as I, so on retrospect in the in June of 2015, when I was talking to those three farmers, I wondered, well, how many more people, you know, are in that sort of situation. And that's really hard to figure that out because it's hard to parse out like what is, you know, how is climate change directly causing people to be displaced and to move, to be on the move. And places, places like the, all over the world, there's always multiple factors of what's, what's happening. Like in Central America, there's tons of factors. There's economic policies, there's history, there's history of military dictatorships, there's all, you know, what there's all kinds of things that that come into play and 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 um and and if you i mean if you think about like farmers in the highlands of guatemala for example and and if the if the um if all of a sudden the heart the rains don't come and you don't really have that much cash then that's then boom you're you're in a crisis and and one of the ways to deal to to um to react or respond to the crisis is definitely to, to attempt to do something about it, whether it is crossing borders or going to a city or doing a number of different things. And so, but it's, but I'm saying all this because it's really hard to figure out how many, like that's been a struggle for, for people to figure out like how, what sort of numbers can you put on for people who are on the move due to direct, you know, due to climate change. And there, ha there are numbers, so the purpose of, for purposes of this evening, I'll, attend, I'll, I'll share some, Mark, Mark actually shared some of the numbers, but if you, if you look at Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, um, who has put out reports on people displaced, um, they are the ones that put out, and it's a number that really corresponds with a number of other numbers, that 22.5 million people per year from 2008 to 2015 were displaced due to um, climate hazards, as they put it. And that number is more than war. It's sometimes two times, sometimes three times more than people displaced by war. And, and, the, and that um, number is expected to get worse. Um, when you look at different projections, and there's plenty of them, and they're pretty wide ranging. They're very wide ranging. Um, 
the projections for people on the move globally, and these are global numbers, again, 22.5 million is a global number. Oh, one thing to mention about that 22.5 million number is it doesn't include slow onset um, climate, climate events, which means it doesn't include drought, which is a huge thing not to include, right? So in other words, those numbers are probably an undercount. But the projections, as, you think, as we think into the, into the future, 2050 is a common year to think about. Um, they range from about 150 million to, to a billion people, depending on what, who's doing the calculations. In other words, there's a wide debate. It's widely debated. There's, there's, um, um, there's not a consensus, but as one, clim as one person who's done empirical research connecting climate events with, with migration told me, she told me, she said, it, it, well, there's a, it might be debated, but what, what we're gonna see if things stay the same. If things stay the same, what we're gonna see is, um, is something unprecedented in human history. Like, it'll be staggering and unlike we've, something, anything we've ever seen before. And so when you think of that, and you think of, um, something like a climate refugee status, right? There is no, of course, there is no climate refugee status. Um, there is not a climate refugee status on a, in an international realm, nor in, a, in any individual countries. I think some countries are debating it. New Zealand might have passed legislation. New Zealand was contemplating legislation that would take 200 to 300 people um, per year. And if you think of the numbers, I just, the, the projections or the numbers of people already on the move, it's a small fraction. But if New Zealand were to do that, that, that could be precedent setting, setting and could be a model for moving forward. But for our purposes tonight, there's no, there's no such, there's not a climate refugee status. So, um, in fact, the definition of refugee is, is very limited in many ways. Um, and so when people are displaced or on the move, or, and a lot of people move around in the countries where they live, but more and more people are going to be crossing borders. And people who are crossing borders without papers, um, without, is, is people, you know, in a border regime, it's a person crossing a border without papers. And this is where, you know, the people are going to meet this world of borders. And so I wanna turn the attention to that for a minute. Um, so thinking about borders, um, one, there's a few ways to look at it, but one, one really telling statistic is to think about how many border walls there are in the world. The, the number of border walls in the world are, they were 15 when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and now they're 77. 77 with two thirds of those constructed after 9-11. So it's being constructed in, with an accelerated pace. Um, and so what, you know, there's, it's a more bordered world than ever before. And one of the examples, of course, is the United States border. The United States border, and just to give you a few stats, which some people probably already know, but when you look at the U.S. border and the border and immigration enforcement budget in 1994, it was $1.5 billion. If you fast forward to 2019, the annual budget was uh, um, $24 billion. That's, it's a historic um, growth, um, never before, unprecedented. Before Trump even took office in 2017, the border and immigration budget, the annual budget in 2017 was $20 billion. Um, so lots and lots of money have been given to the border apparatus. And, and, it, and for example, you can look at a, a number of different things. There's more, there's 21,000 armed border patrol agents up from 4,000 in 1994. There's billions of dollars of technologies on the border, like from high-tech cameras to ground sweeping radar to drones to on um, 12,000 um, implanted motion sensors uh, on the ground. And this is one example of many examples around the world. This, I'm just using the U.S.-Mexico border as it's probably one of the most bolstered and fortified borders, but it's one example of many. And um, it's 700 miles of walls and barriers. And, and so this, this, kind of, this world of um, 
this is the world that uh, is being envisioned in a lot of ways for um, these, these growing displacements of people. And I, and I want to read a quote from you, for you. And this comes from the Pentagon, actually. And this quote, it comes from the two, a 2003 report from the Pentagon uh, titled, An Abrupt Climate Change Scenario and Its Implications for United States National Security. And it goes, the United States and Australia are likely to build defensive fortresses around their countries because they have the resources and reserves to achieve self-sufficiency. With diverse growing climates, wealth, technology, and abundant resources, the United States could likely survive shortened growing cycles and harsh weather conditions without catastrophic losses. Borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back unwanted starving immigrants from the Caribbean islands, and they put in parentheses on an especially severe problem, Mexico and South America. I, I'm, st I'm pretty sure they mean Central America, too. They didn't write it. Sometimes the people doing assessments are geographically challenged, <laughs> often. <laughs> but um, at the same time, the people making the assessments are, are, um, are often you know, what they call national secur security planners. They're the ones that look, that look into the future with very clear eyes in, in terms of US national security. And um, that's, um, I want to mention that because after that 2003 report, there's another one that came out in 2007. And the, the, the one in 2007 was mandated by the US Congress. And it brought together military strategists and national security planners along with climate scientists to look at different gradations of temperatures. And every assessment, and they weren't as crude as the one I just read. They didn't write the words unwanted starving immigrants like the one I just read. but they pretty much said the same thing. There's gonna be a ton of displacement and we, there's gonna be border walls built because of it. And d it didn't matter if it was a 1.5 degree, 2.5 degree, or they went to an extreme levels of five degree um, centigrade temperature rises. And one of the things, and, and this, this I wanna make clear, uh, unders actually underscore this point right here. Um, when you think of the Trump administration, right, you think Donald Trump is a proud climate denier, right, very much, very public about it. He said it a million times. He writes 10,000 tweets about it. And, um, and so, but Don, there's, in the government, there's many moving parts. And, and um, when you think about, like, there's been climate change has been scrubbed clean from different departments, and climate scientists have, have gotten a lot of, um, uh, havoc thrown their way, but at the same time, it's very difficult to find a three-star general who doesn't, who's a climate denier, and in fact, there's none, um, or top DHS officials, Department of Homeland Security officials. They're, um, they're simply not, and one of the reasons is, as, as put forth in that climatic cataclysm, the, the report I just mentioned, it says that for national security planners to plan, they always think 30 years into the future. 30 years in the future. So that the kind of imagination of what putting, as they put, putting the military platform on the battlefield, it's thought 30 years prior, and they, they calculate all kinds of different threats. And there's just no way they're going to um, deny what 97% of climate scientists are saying. They don't. They're, they're, it's always in it. Climate change is is always a part of the, the, the strategy planning. And thus, the other point I wanna make is, as a proud denier, a lot of, the, Trump being a proud denier, a lot of the conversation still is in that realm. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the future is being created. And a lot of us are not in that conversation. And that's a problem. Um, and that's what I mean by the long vision, right? There's a long vision happening. And, um, and that long vision, you can see it, like there's a 2007 report, and then 2010 was the year that climate change was, was declared a, na a national security threat in the United States. And that official declaration set forth a number of things, including climate change becoming a part of the quadrennial reviews of the Department of Defense, and quadrennial, quadrennial reviews are um, the most public statement of mission that the DOD or the Department of Homeland Security has. So they come out every four years. And so since that happened in 2014, you can see 
um, that climate change has entered the, uh, the, threat, the threat landscape of Department of Homeland Security. Um, and there's, uh, you, can look, you can see them talking about the very droughts that displaced the, the three farmers that I met in Tenosique, right? There's a knowledge that this stuff is actually happening, um, that it's going to cause displacement. And if you look at the climate adaptation plans of the Department of Homeland Security, it very much says we need to prepare our borders for what they say, mass migrations. Um, yeah, so, so with that, um, I want to um, turn to a final thought before we go to discussion. And that, that final thought is, um, is one where I'll go back to when I was, like in my personal life, my, my, my thoughts of, like as I was mentioning at the beginning, like the thoughts of my children and quite frankly, every, you know, the future generations and the idea that these, there's a sort of long vision that's, that's being put forth in terms of what the world's going to look like. Will it be a world of border walls and drones and armed guards and proliferating borders everywhere? Um, that's the kind of vision that's, that's in, a, in a lot of ways being, being put forth as we, as we proceed. But as I've, as when I was doing the research for Storming the Wall, I of course went all these different places, met so many different people. Um, like A.G. Sanyo, the, the, the um, muralist, um, he ended up dedicating his life to, to working for climate justice. So I actually interviewed him um, in Paris, in the Paris Climate Summit, after he had walked 60 days from Rome to Paris to, to then present, like, like we, there's, a, there's an urgency that something needs to be done around climate um, based on his experience, right? And there's so many people and so many, like, not only people, individuals, but organizations and movements around the world that I became acquainted with while I was doing the research that it, that it, it really makes it imperative, I think, to, like, end on that note and think about, like, that, um, that if I were to catalog, you know, if I were to catalog everything everyone's doing, it could be a book as high as the ceiling, right? But one, one, one thing I wanted to, I wanted to, to um, mention is, is a, is a, is a project that um, was happening on the, actually on the U.S.-Mexico border. And it, um, for people familiar, it, it's, it's a binational water harvesting project happening just to the, to the east of the city of Agua Prieta, or Douglas, in Arizona, Sonora. And um, I went to um, see the, the water harvesting project. Um, and, uh, you know, I went out and, and there's a number of things that happened with that, with that trip. And one of the things was that I, I met my guides there and they took me, the first thing they took me to was not the, actually the water harvesting project. It was to see a part of the border wall that had been dragged in to Mexico because of a hurricane actually. And believe it or not, Arizona is getting hurricanes these days, or better said, the remnants of hurricanes. But now hurricane season often impacts Arizona. And in 2014, there was a hurricane called Hurricane Odeal, and it just unleashed water in the Chiricahua Mountains, and the water just raged out of the Chiricahua Mountains, down the dry washes, and smashed into the, the, the U.S.-Mexico border. And in Arizona, almost everything has a wall or a barrier. So it smashed in and took part of this barrier a quarter mile inland. It had very heavy steel, made of steel barrier. So it dragged it pretty far. And that's the first thing they showed me. And that was, um, at first, it's it just like, wow, this barrier had been there for over a year and it was being eat, devoured by Mother Earth. It was literally half in, entrenched in the, in the earth as if the planet was eating the border barrier, which to me was, at first, I, it was just, wow. And then now I think it's almost prophetic, right, in, in many ways, because it's left alone, you know, there was spider webs growing off of it, there was, there was purple flowers, pretty purple flowers, um, growing on it. It was not going to be there for much longer. And it just said, like, if left alone, this, there's Mother Earth or has no 
no use for this. It, it will it will not be allowed to remain. It, it it's going it, it's not it has to be maintained in in order to um, exist. And um and but lo and behold, where we were standing, you could see that they had already built up another one where it had been dislodged. So it had already, it had, they'd already built it up. And behind that was a Border Patrol vehicle with a green stripe. And behind that was a big surveillance tower that had just been built for over a million dollars. And on that surveillance tower, there were cameras that could see seven miles away and ground sweeping radar that had 13 mile radius. And the Border Patrol agent was watching us. And also the cameras probably, or you could surmise, I wasn't sure, probably were watching us as well. But the other part of it was before the border, they were, um, they were showing me, then the, my guide showed me the, the, the restoration project. It was a group called Cuenca Los Ojos. It was a binational project, people coming from both sides of the border. And what they were doing was putting rocks into steel mesh cages um, known as gabions. And these gabions would slow water down when water rushed, like the water that rushed from the Hurricane Odeal, but waters from the monsoon season. It would slow it down, and then the earth would drink the water. And then they started showing me, look, there's, there's, um, desert, um, there's the native desert grasses growing again. Look, there's the desert willows growing again. Look, the, the places, the whole area is rehabilitating, re, rejuvenating. The animals are coming back. And um, then they told me the, the, um, the water table had risen 30 feet. Now. If you know what's going on in Sonora and, and Arizona, in southern Arizona, you know there's a drought in many places. In this case, in this area, there's a 15-year drought. The droughts are what is predicted by climate change. When you look at the Pentagon assessments, they talk about water scarcity in nor northern Mexico. That's one of the things they talk about. And here it was, this gabion. And mind you, the gabion, again, it's almost prophetic in, in two senses, because the gabion, the gabions almost looked like an intricately carved stone wall, but it was not a wall. It was a sponge, a sponge being created to, to try to rehabilitate and almost, and I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to be over the top, but it was in reverse a drought. It wasn't reversing a whole drought, but it was responding to a situation that was, is quite dire. Um, and the water was going up on the, Mex on the U.S. side, right? But there's no, like, the, there's, a, there's a wildlife refuge across the, uh, across the border. Nobody, no border patrol stopping that, right? And um, there was water appearing in a community just to the south, and a community that had been seeing less and less and less and less water. Like, it was small scale, it's still small scale, but there's a little bit more water running um, and to me, it's, that's, that's almost like comes down to like what were an example of the choices um, this is, that we have. I mean, I'm sure there's many choices, but the, the choice when you think of the border walls, right, the border walls, there it was, the very border wall, and there they were, the gabions. And the gabions were responding to what people say are, is the biggest existential threat to humankind, right? And the border walls were doing the exact opposite. And here they were, like, kind of side by side. And I asked, uh, at the time I was there, it was, I, it was 2016, and that was when the, the border budget was, border immigration budget, enforcement budget was $20 billion. So I asked one of the founders of Cuenca Los Ojos, you know, what they could do with $20 billion. And um, it was one of those unfortunate moments that I didn't have my recorder um, and she just started talking, and she just started talking, like, talking about places so far away that I'd, ne I'd never even heard of them. Um, in other words, talking about, um, you know, something that could impact so many people in a, in a wide range um, um, and facing, like, the, the um, situations at hand that have been exacerbated cl by climate change in this, this very area. And this is again a, a small scale, a small scale project. But what, you know, what about these projects where you have people coming together on both sides of the border and, and many sides of the border and many sides of many borders around the world? And it seems to me that, um, you know, all these billions and countless billions of dollars are put to um, the border enforcement and border enforcement zones. At least it, it could be 
there's a lot there's other options before us there's another possibilities of a, of a long plan and um, with that I, I want to leave it to questions and discussion and conversation what does the process look like in Central America and South America where education is more scarce than over here I mean, I could talk to about the people I talk to, which are mainly people in, in rural areas and farmers. And I'll tell you, like every, for every farmer I talk to, maybe they wouldn't say the word climate change, or maybe they would, um, but they certainly uh, talked about, I mean, every person I talked to knew about the season scrambling, right? Like, oh, the rains aren't coming in the same time, or a lot of people talked about the canicula, which is that, like, dry period that happens during the rainy season, how it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, a lot of people talk, a lot of farmers talk about coffee rust or la, la roya as they call it. Um, and, uh, and you know, stuff like that. So I like whether the word, the terms of climate change were used, it, everyone knew that the weather was changing. A lot of places have farmers on al almanacs, right? So, oh, you plant at this time and then you know, versions of farmer al almanacs. And, and so like even, you know, e so farmers are the ones that almost you look to when you wanna know what's changing because even like little subtle changes in the soil are noticed. And um, that's what I've, I've found. I can't, I don't know if I can speak to like, what is the, you know, average Joe, you know, um, but I definitely found a, a, a very high awareness of, of what's happening, um, um, especially in rural areas. And then there are, on top of that, as you said, as you mentioned, there are um, more and more environmental groups and, and even, you know, I've seen, I witnessed several environment, you know, protests um, uh, in the Petén in Guatemala. I remember seeing a gigantic one just march, take over a whole town um, over environmental issues. Uh, so there's a sort of like aware, you know, when you have those sorts of movements and, and there's awareness that, percolates around all things environmental and, and climate change is included in that. Um, and so, I don't know, I don't know how to answer your question, but I, I do I have experience that I, I did find quite a bit of awareness that things were happening. It seems like more and more people are aware everywhere. To me, it just, and as, as, as the, now I can't, I don't know, I can't quantify it at all, of course, but the, the whole idea of the dry corridor is very much on the tips of people's tongues that I've, I've talked to. Um, like I just last uh, that in, there was a guy I met right on the border who who um who had just crossed and came back and and um he said forty days and forty nights of no rain you know and he's from the border with El Salvador and he said you know we're in the dry corridor and that's what's happening now and that's you know so that kind of terminology the dry corridor which is a term that you wouldn't necessarily hear maybe ten years ago or twenty years ago is now you know, just anyone's, most people ha are saying it, right? So it makes me think that, it makes me think without, I can't fully confidently say I know, but um, it makes me think that there's a, there's a lot of, of awareness. That, that project, even in that region, that's one project of probably at least 15 I know about that's binational, that's, they're, they're, they have scarce resources because they're hard to come by. Um, but they're trying to revitalize landscapes. They're working through a drought. Um, it's binational, by, by across border projects. Um, and that's just, I mean, one example here. I'm sure there's, you look, you look in different places around the world and there's, there's projects like revitalization projects. Um, but I was using that as not necessarily um, like the answer, but it, like maybe one answer, right? And an example of um, uh, when you think of the border, like if been border and immigration budgets, right? They just keep going up and up and up and up year after year after year after year with no conversation. Like, and it's hard for me to find anyone that even knows that they've been gone up as much as they've gone up, right? Um, that they, they, they just go up and and it's and it's just kind of accepted. And I and I used to think there was no conversation until I, until I started looking at appropriation cycles. And there is a conversation that's happening behind closed doors with industry that's getting border contracts and that sort of thing. And so you have um, this growing industry that's getting a lot of contracts 
that's getting these kind of campaign contributions to key congressional committees and that sort of thing. And you have the budgets that go up and up and up and up. Like, it's, it's, it's surprising to me, like 1.5 billion to 20, nearly 25 billion over 25 years is like, wow, you know? And um, it, it just, it seems to me that there, A, needs to be awareness that that's actually has happened and, and is happening, and then B, like what are we doing, right? When you think of what's, what is um, going on in the world and what really needs attention, um, and um, what we need, to, like if you think of terms of climate change, right? There's the world of divisions with all the kind of displacement that's, that's being projected. The world of divisions is exactly the opposite of what's needed. What, what is needed is climate change is a global phenomenon. It, it doesn't just affect one country, right? Um, is needed is like, like this, the divisions to kind of go away and, and, and people working together across these divisions or these divisions not even existing. And um, now maybe that's too utopian to say right now, but at least like when you think, as, as the budget's going up, going up and up and up, maybe they could at least plateau and we could use the billion dollars that would have gone up in, into something else. Or maybe you could reduce it down a billion and or maybe you can reduce it by, you know, what could it be? I'm just offering like something out there that there are alternatives and there, there's um, things that, you know, when you think of what threats are, like what, when you think of the threat states that are, that are facing the planet, there seems to be these, these gigantic threats that are not being addressed with the, the, the diligence they need to be addressed. And, um, and climate change, obviously I'm trying to make a point, is one of them and perhaps these, these funds could be shifted. Because these funds are all about, when you think about the border, it's like all about the whole idea of the, the fear narrative, right? The what is on the other side of this line that's gonna come and get us, right? It's not talking about kids drinking lead, leaded water in Flint, Michigan, or it's not talking about hospital bills that cost $55,000, or student loans that cost way too much, or all these other places where where um, money could be alleviating to people in the population. It's talking about, it's, make, it's like scapegoating somebody on the other side of the line and then constantly justifying it and constantly building up. And that's, that's the kind of mentality that we're, in, that, that we're in right now and I'm suggesting that that can change. So the United States is externalizing, what they call externalizing or extending its borders. Um, that uh, I wrote, I've written quite a bit on and researched quite a bit on it. There's lots of money going into border programs. There's border programs in over 100 countries. Um, and that's basically uh, to um, what, what CBP has done. They go to different places. They offer assessments of borders in different countries. And then according to those assessments, like for example, in 2006, CBP sent and an assessment team to Dominican Republic. And they went to the border with Haiti and they said, oh, um, your border with, is porous and you need a border patrol. So in 2007, presidential decree, Haiti or Dominican Republic says, okay, we're starting our own border patrol. And lo and behold, 2008, they have their border patrol and that border patrol has been trained by the US, by the US border patrol. The, their border patrol is called CESFRONT, C-E-S-F-R-O-N-T. And um, they're trained by the Border Patrol, and not only that, resources given to them, including weapons, by the Border Patrol. And I, and part, I went and saw Cessfront and Dahabon, and right on the Massacre River, right on the border with Haiti, um, standing their axes. If you go to Nogales, um, Arizona, or anywhere along the border, you'll see that Border Patrol sits on their axes. What they do is they sit right along the border, the border wall the borderline every quarter mile. And that's because, so they have eyes watching the border and that's so they make the border, actual border in urban areas impassable. And that's exactly what they were doing in the Dominican Republic. Um, so that's one example. And these programs are, um, as I said, in over 100 countries. Um, so it's, it's pretty extensive, it's pretty expansive. One of the, one of the, one of the, another key place that they focused on is the Mexico-Guatemala border, tremendous, amounts of money have been put into that. As I said earlier, the, uh, the US official said the US, the southern border with Guatemala, is, is Mexico's southern border with Guatemala is now the US southern border. Um, 
there's uh, just, you know, there's resources and trainings and all kinds of things. And since, really, you can see the results of it because since 2015, 2015, Mexico has deported more Central Americans than the United States, and that reversed the trend. And that's the case today. So, so if you look at U.S. Border Patrol strategy, you read the paper, their, their strategy papers, they say multi-layered. The word multi-layered is used extensively. And when I first saw that word, I thought they were referring to the inland expansion of the border. Like, the border jurisdiction is actually 100 miles inland, and then you have ice in the interior. So I thought, you know, that's what it meant. But it really also means the outward expansion. The idea of layers goes thousands of miles away. The Mexico southern border, but Guatemala now has a has has a new border and three new border patrol units um, along the Honduran border, along the Salvadoran border. Um, Honduras has also border patrol units trained and financed by the United States. El Salvador has border patrol units. Panama. They go down and down all the way to the Colombia and, and, and there's a whole, so if you're coming up from Brazil and you don't have, the, you don't have papers, you're going to go through all these border kind of regimes, one after the other. So when, you, when I read that multi-layered now, which I do, that's what I think of. I think of this, this expansion, and I'm just talking now about the Caribbean and, Central, and South America, but it actually goes further. In my research, I went, I, I went to other places like the, in Kenya, Kenya, believe it or not, they started their own border patrol in 2010 with U.S. funds. Uh, the, I went to the Syrian um, Jordanian border. On that border, uh, Raytheon Corporation received $300 million from the United States to build a big surveillance border system along the Syrian border and the Iraqi border. Um, and I could go on and on. Uh, Philippines, the Philippines, a country of 7,000 islands. It has a um, whole maritime border surveillance system. Again, Raytheon Corporation with $30 million from the United States built what's called the National Coastal Watch Center with this kind of you know, surveillance towers everywhere that, that um, look at the sea and they say, well, we have to control the seas so the global economy functions, right? So it's the idea of like keeping the, the economy um, what, you know, intact and that was one of the one of the big reasons there. So this, this sort of like expansion of the border, um, as uh, I would argue, is, is a huge part of the strategy. And I think you can put the analysis of climate change too. Because it's a whole idea of, of this world, a world in further turmoil, like embroiled in more upheavals, is very much in the, in the minds of, of strategists. And, and th that has to be playing into you know, why we went from 15 to 77 border walls globally, and why, like, when you see, like, where these, these walls are situated around the world, they, they go between the global north and the global south, right? They, they, they and, and not exactly, and that's perhaps maybe too simplistic terminology, but it, it does go, it cuts in in those areas, and it, it really, like, anyone in sub-Saharan Africa who's, like fleeing droughts in those areas, which many are, you know, are going to run into the Libyan southern border, which has been, re so the European Union is our, putting a lot of money into Libya, but also the United States. So you have this kind of front plus Libya, then you have to get through Libya, and then you get to the Mediterranean. And everyone here knows, like, the Mediterranean's, what's happened, you know, with capsizing boats and that sort of thing as people cross, cross through the rough seas. And so, and so, yeah, there's, there's this externalization, and it's growing, and, and, um, and uh, that um, needs to be a, in our awareness, I believe. And so with climate change, like more people being aware of it and recognizing it's an issue, what can we do in like our daily lives to help combat it? I mean, the point is like there's probably a zillion things you can do, um, very, very small things. Um, and uh, to large, much larger things, um, uh, and you know, from doing things around the house or to, to like um, really spreading awareness to even further, you know, like can you join? There's probably groups you can join. There's a growing, growing climate justice movement, and I'm sure um, you've seen like the youth that have been really pushing this 
um, really on a global level, like gr the most the most prominent Greta um, Thunberg, um, but uh, but um, so many that she just what representative so many different youth that are saying, you know, this this is the world that we're inheriting, and we're 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 going to lead the charge and and um, saying that not enough is being done, um, and you know, like they're showing up at like the Davos meetings this last week and and they show up to the climate summits and and that sort of thing so there's a kind of pressure that's happening as well and i think there's more and more opportunities um there's a that sunrise movement i think that's they're they're very that's they're they, that i would recommend you know seeing like um uh what they're doing along you know they, they have many things going on and they're they're push I think in their case they're pushing a lot of legislation and policy and that sort of thing. Like the Green New Deal is another is another thing. These are all things you can look up at, but it, there's what the point is that there's plenty of things to do. But that there's things that they things that need to be done and they probably need to be done sooner rather than later. And I mean according to the science so what we're up against according to the last um, IPCC report, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that came out last year, I believe, or the year before. They, in that report, they said, we have to cut down fossil fuel emissions by 50% by 2030, and then I believe it was almost 90% by 2050. That, what does that entail? And the, in, in other words, to do that, to keep the temperature below 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade um, from warming, and that's, that would be the efforts that, that people have to put into this. So what that's calling for is, is a lot of things, a lot of, you know, a lot of things to be done, um, small and big. And, there, and to me, unfortunately, it gives a sense of urgency that this needs to be done. Um, now, nobody knows, like, you never, the future is, is unwritten, right? So you, never know, you don't know what's going to happen, and there's a lot of X factors. But um, scientists say, you know, like, really, they're starting to say all bets are off after 1.5 degrees warming and that's coming close we're, we're past one degree already and we already we're past one degree already and we're already seeing it you see it here we're very strongly in California um, and um, and 1.5 degree and then two degrees you know that's it seems like the way things are headed two degree is going to be difficult to stave off um, unless there's pretty significant you know action taken. And, um, and it seems to me that's what, at least, maybe it won't happen, but that, that's at least what we have to strive for. Mm -hmm.